It's the Thanksgiving season and we're especially thankful at the Family Foundation for a new day in Virginia where there are more biblically minded leaders than ever before serving in our state government. But how can we be good stewards of this opportunity and actually get laws into place that protect parental rights in schools and human life at all stages? We're gonna talk about that today. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, and I'm joined today by our president, Victoria Cobb. All right, well, since it's the holiday season, I've got a fun little icebreaker question for you. Would you rather have two days of Thanksgiving or two days of Christmas and why? Oh, definitely Christmas. I don't know if that makes me a bad person because I don't want to spend two days in extra Thanksgiving, (laughs) but I'm not that big of a turkey person. You know, I love the family time, but Christmas, there's just so much to get excited about. I mean, the kids, the wonder, the... I don't know. I You're love still Christmas. young at heart yes. for Christmas. I, I would but always go for Christmas. Don't you eat turkey at Christmas too? Um, no, actually, interestingly enough, I'd say we eat ham, and then at Matt's family, it's it's like random barbecue kind of oh, stuff fun. because I don't know deep south. <laughs> okay, well, I would ironically choose Thanksgiving. I should want to choose Christmas because in my mind, that's my favorite holiday. But I don't know about you, but the there's just always this emotional pressure with families on Christmas. And it may, I don't know, just there's just that pressure that it's got to be perfect and everything's got to work out right. And Thanksgiving is just a really chill time. <laughs> I have to be honest. I just need the extra day at Christmas to like actually be ready on time for Christmas. Like I'm the one that's packing and, you know, we, we travel for holidays at the yeah. last second and I'm wrapping gifts at the, I mean, you know, it's like one in the morning and I'm still wrapping gifts. That's why I need two days at Christmas. <laughs> All right. Well, we did mention last time that we were going to delve more into what it looks like after the election when it comes to policy and the practical implementation of that, what it looks like practically for beefing up parental rights, religious freedoms and pro-life protections. And since we opened this up today talking about what's going on with these battles over parental rights, let's just start there. What are we doing to beef up parental rights particularly? Well, there's going to be a bunch of things that we're going to try to address. I mean, the first one is as old as the organization, which is we have for 36 years been trying to get family life education to be opt in, that it is parents' right to turn over to the school, the school, their discussions about sexuality. So that's the first piece. Um, but there's a lot of other things. I mean, on the, you know, we mentioned this, these model transgender policies are constantly, you know, popping, popping into our conversations because they're such a big deal. But one of the things we want to do is have the legislature go back and clarify that these are for sure optional for a locality. They don't have to implement these in their school because right now they're under a, a law that makes it sound like they have to do it. So that's really important. So there's kind of a whole host of things we're going to do to make sure that parents uh, have rights. And ultimately, all of these things head in the direction of we need more educational opportunities available to everyone, which is an expansion of some school choice efforts we've been making over the years, because some parents are just tired of, you know, every time they peel back another layer of the school, they find something they don't like, and they're ready to basically say, I I I may want another choice. And on these surveys, um, we're looking at also trying to put some protections in place for preventing state agencies to go direct to kids, unbeknownst to parents, and ask these sensitive questions, right? Yeah, well, we have to remember we were the state that had the sex text hotline where the Department of Health was directly soliciting our kids about these kind of questions. And so that's a lot of what we can stop if we really put some legislative protections around it. And I just want to go back to the transgender issues in schools for a minute. Now, even if if schools decide they want to allow biological males to go in female bathrooms, um, we're looking at, you know, saying, well, then you need to provide funding, right, for having floor-to-ceiling privacy protections and do what it takes to protect kids. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is there's a lot of ways to skin this cat to make sure that every, all, <laughs> protect every kid, that all kids are protected. We say that so often around here because it's kind of our campaign, but there are a lot of ways to do that. And if a school board really feels that they need to, in their minds, allow people who believe they're the opposite gender of their actual biology, if they're going to allow them in a private spaces, we've got 
to shrink those private spaces to be individual. And so we think budgeting could help. I mean, in some sense, this is a money problem. If everything was single stall, you wouldn't have concerns. If locker rooms weren't open spaces, you wouldn't have these concerns. I mean, when I go to the gym, I go into a, a personalized changing space. Why We're going to have yeah. to look at schools that way. It's irresponsible to just open up multi-use bathrooms like that with kids. Especially kids with the- high school boys. I mean, yeah. we just can't forget who we're talking about. These are not mature adults that handle things in mature ways. All right. Well, we got to get into the pro-life issue here. Um, You know, you've talked a lot about how decades worth of pro-life protections that the Family Foundation fought for specifically had essentially been wiped out in one fell swoop by pro-abortion leaders in the General Assembly. And now we have a lot more pro-life leaders in office. So what do you plan to do to try to restore that lost ground? Yeah, we're definitely going to go back with a restoration bill that would put all of that back. We do have a senator out there saying how pro-life he is in the news, and he has given us some good votes. He actually voted against that repeal, even though he's a Democrat and his party went in one direction. He went in the other. If you have that, you end up in the Senate with a 2020 tie that the lieutenant governor can break. So we think we can restore Things like informed consent for women, safety standards for abortion facilities, um, making sure a woman has a right to her ultrasound. So it's actually pretty exciting to think that we could get those back. And I will say we'd love to see an addition to those, which is now there's this abortion reversal pill. There's literally a way that if you take a chemical abortion and you regret it right away, we actually can save that human life, which is a mind-blowing thing. But we think women need to know about that before they go through with an abortion, before they, you know, that they ha- that they if they have regret, we we may have a way to deal with this, which, um, again, people just don't know about this. So that seems like it needs to be part of informed consent. So we'll probably go after that a little bit, too. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. Now, it's interesting you mentioned this one senator, and that brings up a question I have because I know the two senators we're thinking of here are Morrissey and Peterson. Are they, with their ability to be potential swing votes on important pro-family issues, are they the Virginia version of, you know, the mansion and seminar that we see in Congress affecting everything. Oh, I mean, they, people are already writing articles about these are kind of the kingmakers. If they want the legislation, it's going to go. If they don't want it, it's going to be blocked. And, but the good news is I thought maybe Morrissey was only a vote on life issues, but he's out there talking about school choice. So yeah. we're going to have another avenue. And Chap Peterson has typically been one that we rely a little bit more on for like religious freedom. He seems to understand. So one of the things we're going to try to do is take that Virginia Values Act that's been so damaging for our Christian ministries and our churches and our schools, we're going to try to amend that and get all the faith-based elements, not the law to not apply to all these entities. And so, again, this is a case where if Chap Peterson, if we can capture him on that one vote, we get what we want. Now, I have to pause because it's scary when things sit in the hands of of just two potential people. And I also see the news and I see Senator Morrissey is out there still trying to get another casino. In That's Central, Joe Morrissey. Yes, right? Joe yeah. Morrissey, Senator Morrissey. So, you know, in one sense, he's like this great on life and school choice. We might get great evidence. In another sense, he really wants, desperately seems to want a casino and is now looking at Petersburg. And I sit there and think, yikes, you know, he's the one vote people need. Are they going to cave on something he wants? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's trading. I hate to say yeah. it. It's 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 devastating to citizens to think that that's how it really works. But we watch that sometimes the reality is that is how it works. Well, it's also an illustration of why your vote is important when it comes down often to two people like that and that they need to hear from you. So that comes back to the power of your voice. I would say pro-family citizens that happen to live in those two Senate districts have extra responsibility. Which are? are um, So it's basically the city of Richmond area is Joe Morrissey's Mm -hmm. Senate seat. And Chap Peterson is up in northern Virginia. Um, But I would say that burden's going to be we're going to be, you know, asking you to make a little call, make a little email, put, you know, put a little pressure on, build a relationship, you know, have a voice. Well, real quick, we also mentioned we would talk about the push going on to commercialize marijuana, you know, the pot shop on every corner kind of thing. Can you speak to that real quick? Yeah, I don't get the sense that there's an appetite among the Republicans to totally decriminalize, I mean, to, to reverse the decriminalization. We already have legal marijuana. And I unfortunately, I, I don't think they're going to take that back. 
but we have not commercialized it yet. We've said we're going to. And that's what we're talking about, as you mentioned, with the pot shops on every corner. So what we're going to really work on is can we limit that as tightly as possible to say we don't need these shops in every corner. And there's ways we can do that. One thing is we can tell a locality. We can make it local option. So a locality could say, okay, we're not going to have commercialization in our county. And that starts eliminating you know, how bad it gets across the Commonwealth. And there's other things like maybe we don't allow edibles because that's what ends up harming children in hospitals. Yeah. So there's there's a fair amount of around the edges, even if we can't all the way take this thing back, that we could do to improve what it could have looked like if we don't have um, strong pro-family voices in that conversation. So just to clarify, is there still going to be an opportunity people need to watch for to opt their community out of that? Or that That's what we will, this legislative session is, we will find out. That is the goal, that it would that we would stay and that basically by the end of this legislative session, the legislation would allow an, a local option. And then what we would expect is people need to go to their school board. I mean, sorry, school board, board of supervisors. People will need to go to their board of supervisors and they'll need to say, we want to put this referenda on our ballot. We want to basically as a county be able to vote just the same way you do in lots of things in Virginia. You vote for, you know, uh, the casino mm-hmm, stuff was a mm-hmm. local issue. So we want to put on our ballot not putting a shop of this type in our county. Yeah, we want to protect our kids, our schools. We don't want these pot shops in every corner. We can opt out of this as a community. And hey, if we could stop the casino in Richmond, you can stop the pot shops next to your school in other absolutely, communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's real opportunity here. And you know, sometimes you can't get everything you want out of a Senate that's this close and a House that honestly, our House is it's a hundred people. We have fifty-two Republicans, forty-eight Democrats, and on ideology, it doesn't break perfectly along clean lines. So we don't know on every issue exactly what that looks like. But, you know, you can get as much done as possible. And that's what we're going to be doing is taking advantage of the opportunity to put forward pro-family ideas and really encourage them to do the right thing by our citizens. Well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! Okay, when I first saw the headline for today's Inconceivable topic, I did think it was a Babylon Bee article, but unfortunately it wasn't. And as always, today's Inconceivable is 100% true. The woke crowd is coming for our church hymns. Yeah, this story is ridiculous and heartbreaking at the same time. What's happening is the Presbyterian News Services, which apparently is the news arm of the Presbyterian Church USA, they announced the creation of a new hymn called The Climate is Changing. And it's kind of wild to see this thing visually because it's all laid out exactly like you would see in an old-timey church hymnal book. Yeah, except now it's got these newfangled woke lyrics. Okay, I'm going to just try to sing these new hymn lyrics or kind of talk them out because I am not a singer of people. But I'm going to try to kind of talk them out in the way that they're meant to be sung to the tune. And Victoria, I want you to tell me if you recognize the tune here. Okay, so here this goes. We pray for the animals here in our midst who cannot defend their own right to exist. We pray for the mountains and forests and seas that bear the harsh footprint of our human creed. Okay, I think I, think I kind of massacred the <laughs> That's tune all right. At the That's end. all right. You got the general. And yes, I do recognize the tune. Um, it is actually set to a hymn that we used to sing um, in my Presbyterian church growing up. It's called Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. And honestly, this is especially sad and outrageous when you consider what the actual lyrics are to the original hymn. So the original hymn went something like this. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Let's just hear a little clip of that, the actual hymn there, so people get the idea of what we're talking about. You know, the contrast there really is startling between the climate is changing him and the original one that that the tune is from. I mean, 
here you are talking about worshiping the creation rather than the creator exactly as the Bible warned us about in Romans. Yeah, this is really awful. I mean, I you know, we did get a warning this was going to happen, but to see it so directly done where there's there's a hymn that was created to to absolutely praise God for all of who he is and this takes it to just paying attention to his creation, and it misses the entire point. Um, and, you know, this was just a beautiful old Scottish hymn that I think the Presbyterian Church, I don't know. I mean, I've always sung it in the Presbyterian churches growing up. It's kind of a, it's kind of a classic. Yeah, and you're, instead of now worshiping the Ancient of Days, you're worshiping what the Ancient of Days created. So it's, it's kind of weird to see Romans warning playing out in real time in our society. Yeah, well, apparently a Presbyterian minister, you know, obviously of the more liberal ilk, decided to create this lovely little earth worship tune in advance of the climate talks that happened in Scotland. You know, the ones that President Biden fell asleep at? Yeah, that one. Well, I guess in a way, this hymn kind of goes along with the really uplifting message we heard coming out of that whole climate conference in Scotland. Um, Here's some more environmentalist lyrics just to give you more hope in your heart. The climate is changing. Creation cries out. Your people face flooding, fire, and drought. At least it all rhymes. I mean, you got to give him points that, you know, he, he at least made it still sing songy. But anyway, I, I guess what that means is that we're just going to have to give this week's Inconceivable Award to the authors of The Climate is Changing and the PCUSA Church for taking hymns that glorify the Lord and turning them into activist gobbledygook. Okay, and I do think we have to promise our audience that this is going to be our last singing Inconceivable. So if that was a bit torturous for you, don't have any fear. And I want to give credit to our producer in case you did happen to hear her voice trying to help me joining in. That's Catherine, our producer. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.